Okay, so faster unpacking allows us to improve the speed of builds of auto package shares, Im image builders, cloud instance provisioning, and stuff like that. Because unpack time dominates. And we notice that XC is quite slow. It takes about 40% of the time for unpacking. With Eat My Data, so if you don't do synchronized uh, file system, and it takes 10% of the time without it. And we can switch, the, we can switch from XZ to CSTD, which cuts the user time in half. So it, instead of taking, so this means that instead of taking 40%, the 40% of the unpack time basically go away. And if you use the compression level, the highest compression level ZSTD has in the normal mode, which is 19, the file size is only 6% larger, which basically means that downloads will be 6% slower at the same connection speed. But um, that's a problem, of course, if you have slow connection speed. But for upgrades, we can solve the problem using Delta DAPs. There will be a talk on Friday about Deltas. And this feature is available in app 1.6, but it also needs support in dpackage. We have added support for CSTD compression in dpackage in Ubuntu 18.04. It's not in Debian yet, so we just want to try out if it works or not. If it does, we'll support it, and if not, we'll just drop it eventually. And another thing we were working on, which some of you might have noticed, is um, locking. So sometimes, you know, when you're on apt, in the middle of the transaction, you get dpackage error, dpackage status database is locked by another process. The reason for that is that we currently have a race condition. So when you run an apt install, apt first acquires the dpackage lock, and then before it executes dpackage, it has to release the lock. Um, and after dpackage ends, it has to acquire the lock again. So in these two uh, cases, before the dpackage before dpackage acquires the lock and after dpackage releases it and we relock it, the lock is lost and another process can run and block our block us from uh, running dpackage again. And the solution for that is to introduce a another lock file, which is the lock front end lock. And apt and dpackage both acquire the uh, front end lock normally. But if dpackage is run by apt or another front end implementing this, um, apt tells it to not run, to not acquire the front end lock. So apt will always keep the front end lock locked, and dpackage will lock its normal lock. So if you have another dpack, uh, you want to run dpackage in parallel in another uh, app or you want to run it on your own, then Deepex will notice that the front end lock is still locked by apt and will not run, which means that your apt process is safer now and should not be interrupted by concurrent dpackage runs. And we implemented this in, it's implemented in dpackage the Git, uh, the current master branch, and it should be released soon in dpackage 1.19.1. And patches for apt, Python app, package kit, and other tools will be coming later. They're mostly ready, but they still need some fine tweaking. Yeah? Can you go? I think that. There's a mic. So I'm curious if, uh, if I'm not rude, do I still need all that locking? Well, if you're not root, you don't lock normally. But if I say I'm running the upgrade in one window and another window, I'm not root. Can I run that non-root queries without being locked? You can run the non-root queries. Sometimes you get weird results because it's in an inconsistent state, but mostly it's going to be fine. Um, that's basically the same as it is now. And. The next thing 
that I talked about last DEF CONF was uh, SecComp sandboxing. So we added SecComp sandboxing last year for uh, our downloading methods because there's a lot of dangerous stuff in there like TLS uh, and HTTP passes. So we're working with untrusted input and we want to ensure that it can do the least damage possible if it's compromised somehow. And SecCom sandboxing allows us to restrict the syscalls that can be executed and other sys then we can then we can sys then we can make other syscalls we can trap them or we can abort the program or we can make other syscalls return an error and this works fine for some programs but if you have a libc if you use libc it's getting a bit complicated and you do networking because um, there are NSS modules in libc which allow you to have custom DNS resolving features and they can use different syscalls so you could use like POSIX IPC in your uh, NSS module for looking up DNS servers using a local IPC uh, server and then we have the syscall blocked and it's not working and some code in the libc also calls some unexpected syscalls sometimes and if we're not prepared for those the app the uh, app just crashes basically it it uh, traps the error currently and then you can't download anything which obviously is a bit bad so earlier this year i turned it off again and i'm trying to uh, figure out how to turn it on again and Handling the failures, I think we're probably going to uh, make the syscalls return a permission error instead of uh, doing the trapping we do now, which means that if the syscall fails, it allows it to uh, the program to uh, work around it and ignore the error. Like if it can't access its files, it can just use defaults or something like that, which should make uh, the whole sandboxing a bit more stable. It was what I did originally, but it has the disadvantage that uh, you can't uh, fi figure out which syscalls are being blocked because you just see, uh, because you just get the permission errors and not just a straight crash which you can debug. The next thing is related to HTTP method and other methods. And basically, you might have noticed that if you have used uh, Google Cloud, for example, which has uh, IPv6 disabled by default because app used to have app used to resolve um, app used to connect uh, to the addresses returned by the DNS resolver sequentially so try the first IPv6 address and the second IPv6 address and so on uh, before I tried the IPv4 addresses and the timeout between the tries was two minutes so if you have four IPv6 addresses it would take eight minutes to fall back to IPv4, which obviously is too slow to be usable. And those uh, some clouds and stuff overrode this and disabled IPv6 handling in apt. And we can solve this. We solved it in 1.6 by switching to a new protocol, which is Happy Eyeballs 2. Or it's not entirely compliant to the uh, specification, but it works quite well. So what we did here is instead of trying to connect after each other, we start, we start first by reordering the list. So we alternate between the IPv6 and the IPv4 addresses. So we try IPv6 address, then an IPv4 address, then an IPv6 address, then an IPv4 address. But instead of doing it sequentially, we do it concurrently. So we start with the first address, and then every 250 milliseconds, we add a, another address and we try them all in parallel using the select syscall. And the first address that can connect is used as the, as the connection and the other connection attempts are aborted by closing the file descriptors. And if none of them connect immediately in these 250 milliseconds, we get to a final wait for all scenario where we wait 30 seconds before timing out and this basically allows us to uh, fall back from IPv6 to IPv4 
in 250 milliseconds, which makes the whole thing much easier to use and avoids having to disable IPv6 and apt on uh, images and stuff like that. Another feature we've been working on very recently um, is this one. Yeah. You can see what it does. You might be able to see what it does. Basically, the, the clue is in the last line. It suggests you a snap that's available. And that's not the entire story, of course. We wanted to enable other package managers to be able to suggest their own packages, like snaps, for example, or Flatpak. And while apt has existing hooks, they're fairly limited in scope, and they use ad hoc formats, which have uh, not enough information, like which packages were given to the install command for uh, the uh, hooks to suggest other packages. So we introduced new hooks, and we base them on JSON RPC. And these hooks get past a socket where they act as a server and then app calls methods within the hooks using JSON RPC and provides a lot of data um, related to the request. And we can extend this in the future to allow app to act as a server and have bidirectional uh, communication. So for example, if you have app list box, it could just instead of having to uh, add a pin, you could just block the upgrades for release critical bugs directly, and you would have, you, then the user wouldn't see the update for the release critical bug, it would be held back directly. And you can make other changes too, like uh, remove some packages you don't want user to install, and stuff like that. And we can also extend this, I think, to a command, let's say apt uh, rpcd, which basically opens the JSON RPC socket and then allow people to uh, script apt using that interface. So instead of a library, you just open a connection to the socket and tell it to install something, which I think might be quite useful. And we have an example hook here. We can see that we're trying to install an existing package called foo, and this hook is called a pre-prompt hook because it runs before this yes-no prompt, whether you want to install or not. And it gets multiple parameters. The first one is the command that was used. In this case, it was install. The search terms, which are the arguments to the command. So if you, in, if you have install foo, it contains foo. You have install foo bar, it contains foo bar. You have install foo bar minus, it contains foo bar minus, and so on. And then any unknown packages pass to the command line, which basically are a subset of the search terms that could not be resolved. And finally, we have the list of all resolved packages and the versions uh, that are available, like the candidate version and the version that was selected for installation. And then you can see here, foo version 1.0 was marked for installation. And if you have this bidirectional uh, handling in the future, you could then say, like, oh no, let's instead mark version 2 for installation or stuff like that. And here you can just, here you just notice that uh, you have to install a package foo, and you could say, oh, I have a package foo 2 in my snap or flat pack thing, and just uh, say, hey, do you want to install this instead? and then tell app to abort the install. Or you could just print a line, hey, there's a snap called foo, like it did on the, uh, the two slides earlier. <laughs> and we also have another thing I've been working on, uh, I think last month or so, which is a new solver, because our solver sucks. So we can't find solutions, although they exist. And we see that in uh, unattended upgrades, I think, a lot, where you get the error message uh, in the title, which is package problem resolver, resolve generated breaks. This might be caused by held packages. So <laughs> to solve this, we already have these external solvers, like ASP cut and stuff. 
And they usually work better, but they are really slow because first we convert to an EDSP format, then the EDSP format is converted to cut, and then is passed into the solver, which converts it again, and then the whole thing back. So it takes multiple seconds to solve uh, a simple install request. And so my idea was to use the approaches we had from these external solver research, but build a fast solver. And for that, w I used the same basic solver as uh, ISPCAT, which it is uh, the CLASP solver. It's an answer set programming tool. And it also understands other types of optimization problems like maximum satisfiability and uh, pseudo Boolean optimization. Um, pseudo Boolean optimization is what I use here. And the nice advantage of this is that you can find a solution if one exists. And it's the one goal I have is to try to behave as close to the current solver as possible, which means I'm preferring first choices in OR groups. I want to install recommends when available. And also, if I have non-candidate versions that are necessary, I want to be able to uh, install those non-candidate versions, but try to maximize the candidates that are installed, which allows us to have auto package tests that pull as much as possible from testing and then pull the fewest amount of packages needed uh, to satisfy the dependencies from unstable, which will be really useful, I think. And that's it for apt itself. So in other news, we have Python apt. Now checks uh, that packages belong to the same cache. So previously, when you did a dev cache dot mark install package, and you had reopened the cache in between, it would just crash, do nothing, or just do anything, really, because it was either it was a different package, or it was out of bounds, or yeah. So. <laughs> We, we just now raise an exception if the cache is different, which makes the whole thing much safer. And there's a workaround for existing code in the high-level app module, which automatically remaps these objects when reopening, so you can just use existing code, and it doesn't just break, which is really useful. And we also have fully static typing now in the Python app module, which found a few errors in the code. It's nice. So from the dpackage maintainer, he wants to let you know that you should stop accessing valid dpackage directly because the format will change. For example, soon the list and md 5 some files will be dropped and replaced by m files. So yeah, just don't use valid dpackage. And aptitude has a new release now, and it also builds faster than it used to. So it saves times on the build -ds. Yay. And well, in the package kit land, we now can remove, uh, automatically remove related unused dependencies when, it, when uh, you're installing a package, which helps uh, avoid cluttering your system with packages you don't longer need. You, you, don't, you no longer need. <laughs> and uh, finally, there will be a talk on Delta Dabs on Friday, which you might want to attend. And that's it from me. If you have any questions, I don't think we have a lot of time, like one minute or two. So if you want to ask a question, go to the mic and ask. Or just come after the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Now is now in is incompatible. Can you start from the beginning? Yeah. Can you re Repeat. Okay. Uh, can you tell me why that apt apt get and apt tilde are not compatible? Well, the app, app, apt and apt get are the same. Basically, they just have some different defaults. Can it be configured? Sorry. Can the parameters be configured to make them uh, have the same action? Well, you could do that. It's just different default config options, basically. Okay. 
where they are overwritten per binary and you can just replace the per binary override in your config file. But, yes. yeah. yeah but, but what? It's not really documented that well. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, that's it. <laughs>